Hey, sir. Well, thanks so much for coming on the show. This is great. Uh, great to meet you. This is how we meet each other nowadays, you know, over, over the internets. Uh, so tell us a little bit about yourself and your organization and uh, what you're passionate about. Well, we have uh, a few platforms. So I am Steve Swan. I'm the chief of innovation at StaffBot. And we also have a mobile app called Aaron Health. And what StaffBot has provided is the bridge between and a very barren desert between innovation and providing clinical care workers to hospitals. Um, so we are trying to make it easier to find quality clinicians for hospitals as well as the clinician to more quickly work for the hospitals to provide clinical care to the patients that need them. My passion is just that. It's the innovation where we find none. And this is a place where there hasn't been significant or remarkable innovation for quite some time. It's a very protracted process to get clinicians working in front of patients today. Interesting. So can you tell us a little bit about the nuts and bolts? Like how, how does it actually work? So we'll start with Aaron Health. And Aaron Health is really what we what has been our um, I guess more most publicized platform as of late. Aaron Health is a mobile app. It's an aggregator. So you can think of it like Indeed or Kayak, but it does it for, for healthcare jobs. And not just for a full-time job that maybe a nurse is in San Francisco looking for one in Los Angeles, but there may be travel opportunities for that nurse to fill a void in say Miami, Florida. So he or she can very quickly say, I'm a registered nurse, I'm intensive care unit, I want to work nights, I'm available after October 1st, and I'm only looking for jobs that pay over $4,000, and those jobs will be presented. But where we take it a step further is we want to know about the humanity behind that person looking for the job. So, for instance, um, some of the job aggregators that we have today don't ask you, what do you like to do? Are you a foodie? Do you like to hike? Are you looking for a metropolitan city? Or are you just looking for pay, which is fine, but we wanna know about the person. So we have taken the time to go out and rank and put weighted values upon each one of the 6,200 hospitals that are in our, our platform so that clinicians can match their lifestyle as well as what their vocation is and what they're looking for for their family. I really love that idea. I mean, I'm surprised that nobody else has done it because if you think about it, I mean, every single solitary job board out there just just is just focused on the job itself it's very little of anything outside the job but it, it's a whole if you think about it you know the, the the life outside of work is it more uh, almost more important and you really need to have that featured in there as well what 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 drove you to that is i mean it's a great it's a great idea i was just wondering how that concept came about well travelers first of all there is a lot of uh say a lot of there there is diversity with the hospitals themselves and the communities in which they provide care as well, the, a nurse that's looking for a position may only look at the rate and a hospital may not be able to offer that particular rate, but they're able to offer different things. So I say putting the humanity in that life decision of finding the job, that's where there was a, there was a pretty big void. So for instance, a hospital that is in Dubuque, Iowa may not be able to pay the same rate as in uh, somebody that's in Fresno, California, but they may have merits about that city that that nurse may be looking for. So they can still provide that clinical care, or at least there is a reason that they would want to travel to that city to go work a 13. It, it has been for, for so many years, it's just rate, rate, rate. And then the nurse may have a poor experience when she arrives. Um, it may be better to take $100 less per week but in that city, the cost of living is so much lower and ultimately they're returning more for their family or it's near Mount Tamalpais and they can go mountain bike riding, which is better than money anyway. So that's what we were trying to do. And we, we have a pretty, we work with 6,000 hospitals. We won't, don't work with 6 million employers. So we have the time, although we're doing it now uh, with more automation, but we're able to identify those hospitals in a smaller community or yeah. You know, the, the employer community is smaller than it is to the broader range of employers out there. Now, is it something about this specific type of, of vertical that you can do that with, or is this something that can apply in other areas as well? Uh, interesting you say that. So we are now finding such success with the platform that is becoming evident to us and revealing that because we are automating the way that we are weighting the life factors 
of these hospitals that we can do it in a variety of different markets. So stay tuned for the answer there. But you don't see it uh, going anywhere. Is it, sorry, let me backtrack. Is, uh, is, is it something special about this specific type of workforce that this works for and it wouldn't work for anybody else? Or is this something that you, you think is, is more transferable? Uh, Great question. So we started with travel nursing. Travel nursing is, uh, they are clinicians who are looking for short-term or even longer-term assignments in different cities throughout the nation. So for instance, they may be licensed in one compact state, but that affords them to work in one of 40 states throughout the nation. So they are, they are able to, to pick up and move somewhere for three months, work there, and then travel on to another location. A lot of these locations, these nurses have never been before. So that is why we, we found that was our entry point for this market and why, or why we created this app was to serve that community. Now, what we've learned, though, is that nurses may want to make a more permanent move. So they may be looking for a full-time job. So we've offered full-time in there as well. So it's not aggregating just for the contract positions or travel positions. It's doing it for full-time um, full positions as well. So how different would you say the travel nurse, is is, it, is that what it's called, travel nurse market? Or what, what, right. is, what is the, so how different would you yeah, say the travel, travel nurse market is from, say, your typical remote worker? I mean, they're almost the same now. I mean, haven't those things kind of converged? Well, through telehealth, for sure, that there's more of that uh, evolving today, particularly in the pandemic, because we didn't have, patient care couldn't be provided bedside. So the world had to shift to a different dynamic and paradigm of providing care. Uh, certain census because there is unpredictable, there's a certain amount of predictability, but as the census goes up and goes down, they need to flex up and flex down with that same amplitude and frequency. So that would be a travel nurse. You can consider something like a flu season. It doesn't happen in the summer. It happens during a particular time of the year. So that, that, predictability says we're going to need more nurses in our emergency room or, and our intensive care unit. And depending upon the demographic that they're serving, they may be able to predict where, what the acuity is going to be for that particular patient. So those, that's where travel nurses come in, that come in. They're going to serve that difference between the full-time high census and what the full-time that they've got at the low census. It's interesting because I think every nurse that I've had over the last little while has been one of those because they're always talking about moving all over the country. Is this, <laughs> is this really a common thing now? Is that there's a lot more, not more nurses who are falling into that category where they're, they're, they're traveling or is that, is it rare? Uh, well, more so now I, it is, you know, we live in an Instagram world. You open up Instagram or social media, it is, you know, an RV next to the Grand Canyon. There's a yeah. different person that is out there than in the workforce than the person that I was when I went into the workforce. I went to the workforce looking for a job that's going to, that I, at which I can work for the next 40 years. Oh yeah. That's a, that's different. My 24 year old son, although he's been with his company for, since he graduated school, it, it's just a, a different approach. It's a different mind space than, than you or I had during that same year, during that same time in our life. That's so yes, I, I would I would suggest that it's just it's different today. Yeah, but I, I love I love the co this concept so much is that I, I can't see why uh, that same kind of holistic job search type of thing type of technology would work in pretty much every field because wouldn't people be interested in these other pieces sure. no matter which field you're in? Yeah, and there's a variety of different resources for doing that. That you know the the gig economy is real, and we have a different workforce than we formerly had. If your audience takes a look at Air and Health, what our app offers is more than just an aggregator. We offer, like I said, lifestyle, but we tell you precisely how much you're gonna get paid. We're gonna tell you what the crime rate is there. We're gonna tell you, do you need a car? What's the walkability score? What's the weather gonna be like during the three months I'm going to be there or the year that I'm planning to be there? Um, what's my cost of living if I need a one bedroom apartment or if I've got four people in my family? How much is a head of lettuce? What about a glass of beer? We're giving them every single data point that they would need. So if you think about going on maybe a different job aggregator and looking up a job, it's gonna tell you, here's what the company is and here's what the pay is. Well, now I've got to open up <clears throat> 10 more browser windows because I wanna find what's important for me before I do my research on that single job. Our app bridges the disparity there and says, 
here's all the information in one place. Now you can make a decision or at least contact the recruiter for that position and get the questions that aren't answered, most of which are answered in Aaron Health. Interesting. So where do, where do you get the data for all this? Is it just, you just scour it off the web and you have different data sources or where does it come from? Yeah, a variety of different data sources. We integrate with over 50 different endpoints to gather this data. Um, some of it is publicly available and some of it is, well, it's all publicly available, but some of it we pay for and some of it we scrape from sites. Very cool. And uh, yeah. how long have you been around? Aaron Health, our launch date was September 27th. StaffBot has been around since 2018. Okay. Um, we have, yeah, yeah, that's how long we've been around. So are you, have you been with the company from the very beginning? Yes. My, I sold two of my companies to a company called TotalMed in 2017. I went to work with them as their chief technology officer uh, in that same year. Um, we broke off and started a new company called StaffBot that created a suite of platforms for uh, clinical labor, clinical contingent labor, uh, a, an applicant tracking system, a vendor management system. And then we have recently created Aaron Health. Very cool. So yeah. when you first started this, so you were, you were one of the founding, you, you were the founder or were you one of the founders? I am I'm one of the founders for both of the companies, yes. Okay. And then can you tell me a little bit about some of the challenges you came across for like trying to get your first client? I mean, how did you, how did you get your first customer? Well, showing technology that you have, you hold in very high regard is sometimes challenging because um, your passion may not translate to their passion. So mm -hmm. even building what we offer a variety of platforms. So we'll talk about the vendor management system. That's a really good example. I've been working in the VMSs for over 20 years and finding the inadequacies in those platforms is not uh, is not hard because they're not catered to the healthcare system. So, so when you go to a hospital and you say, hey, you know how much time you're spending on separating your timesheets? We get rid of that for you. How long is it taking you to get a nurse for that position for pediatric ICU? Now you can match candidates immediately. So we found the things that are going to help provide clinical care. And then when we could speak to them with that, with that same passion and, and it translates, then we were able to get our first customer. And that was, we started the company in 2018 and we secured our first customer in that same year. Nice. So you started with vendor management or did you start with, did you have a whole suite at the beginning or? We did. We have ATS and our, we have one customer that uses our ATS and um, that is as far as that, that will go. They are the only ones mm -hmm. that will be using that. And our VMS, we have uh, several customers that are using that nationwide. Yeah, I know vendor management is is a disaster, at least from what I've heard. Yeah. Yeah, I know who's ever worked with one. It's like, is there yeah. even one good system out there? I don't think so, right? I mean, it's, it's just a, a, a space waiting for tons of disruption to occur. So that's- Totally agree. And they're yeah. so broad. So the specificity with healthcare is, healthcare is very different. You are managing their license, their certifications. You have the joint commission that comes in and audits the hospital. So you have to be ready for that. None of those systems are fully prepared to support that type of ecosystem. Ours is. So when you look at our vendor management system, as soon as a nurse license goes in there, we are monitoring not only that license, but any other state in which that nurse is licensed every 15 minutes. So if a license is suspended in California, but they're working in Nevada, the unit manager will know that immediately. We're the only mm. system that offers that. Basic life support, the BLS card with American Heart Association, it's ubiquitous. Every clinician has to have a BLS card. Right, right now with the other VMSs, somebody has to upload that BLS card or they have to manage an image of that BLS card. Ours, we take the code from that card. Now, every time it gets updated, we import it automatically into our mm. system. So we're a dream for the joint commission because as soon as they walk in to do an audit, all they have to do is open up an instance of that assignment and they can see all the compliance right there. We also integrate with the, um, with the medical screening um, we, we, the medical screening companies so we can quickly submit and query and bring back those medical, um, the medical results instantaneously. Same with backgrounds. We integrate with backgrounds online. So we, we, we accelerate and automate a large part of what's specific to just healthcare. The other VMS platforms don't even come close to that. 
So it sounds like the, what, what StatBot's doing is very different from what Aaron's doing. So StatBot, you were, you were chugging along, you were, you were doing a thing, you bring your clients in, it's more of a corporate B2B play, right? What made you, right. like what took you off in that direction to do, to do Aaron? Like, <laughs> did you see a demand? Was it a Skunk Works project? I mean, you said you have innovation in your job title. It makes me think one day you're just sitting there going, oh, there's a huge opportunity here and we haven't touched it. I mean, how did, how did the, like, where's the origin of that, of that concept come from? Uh, well, you, it sounds like you know me. So yes, the, it, it was a, <laughs> innovation oh in your God, job title, you, man. <laughs> well, I asked somebody, you know, how are you looking for these jobs? And I, you know, to watch the, sometimes what they would go through is, I don't want to be so dramatic and say that it's traumatic, but it is very protracted. It's very laborious. So anytime you see that, or I see that, or somebody else sees that, you see an opportunity. How do we innovate so that we can automate and make this experience best, best and bring back humanity to something, yeah, just to their life so they can do something other than engage in this manual labor to go find a job or go research the city to which they're going to travel. So yes, that was a longer answer to say yes. It was just saying, my God, I can't believe that this is what you go through to go find a position for a travel assignment. Let's go make it easier. So that was, I mean, were you talking to customers of StaffBot? Is that who gave you this idea? Or like, where, like where, I'm just trying to figure out where did the, where did the input for the, for the concept come from? Sure. I mean, who was? Well, our applicant trafficking, first of all, we work with a phenomenal organization at Total Med. They use StaffBot ATS. So we are already in, we communicate with those nurses on a daily basis and the recruiters and the account managers and uh, Sage Shaw and Jason Beck, they are the owners at Total Med, uh, just a phenomenal group. So that collaboration is ongoing. Um, we, are, we are bringing a new audience to travel nursing. We are not changing the audience. We are not giving the audience at travel nursing a, a, a different way. I guess we are a different way to approach it. But, you know, we're making it easier for the hospitals to get clinicians. So the idea was, hey, this is a process that some nurses still embrace today. Let's introduce another process that bring, may bring in more clinicians that are going to go work bedside at the hospitals. So we're just adding to, I wouldn't suggest that we're, we're taking away from. Right. Well, it sounds to me you would have very easily been able to sort of add that sort of like the consumer side of the ATS <laughs> on, mm -hmm. like you'd be able to create that. Was it your idea to do the more holistic approach or was there some requests for it, <sighs> demand for it? Where did that come from? Uh, well, I surround myself pe with people way smarter than me, so I'm just the assembler <laughs> rather than the, the nucleus, um, but I work with some great people, um, Shelly Daring, Ryan Zacha, Tessa Rasmussen, uh, Charles Cooper, Rayleigh McDonald. Uh, they are just brilliant, brilliant people, a as well as the people that we've got working within um, our, our VMS and the customers, the affiliate providers uh, with which we work uh, over 150 today, um, and just hearing if this were easier, if this were easier, if this were easier. Uh, we, we just went out and did it. I think the idea fairy lands on people's shoulders every two minutes, but we just went and executed upon it. Right. So did you guys do build it, build it internally? Was it an internal skunk works mm -hmm. sort, of, sort of project or did you was. outsource it or how did that work? No, we built it internally. Mm -hmm. And we've got a very broad, deep bench of uh, very good developers on a, on a broad range of frameworks. Uh, this one we did in Swift UI because of the com components that Swift offers to us to accelerate the development. Um, and over 80% of the community that works for, uh, it was somewhere within the StatBot ecosystem are iPhone users. And so that's where we started. And then eventually we will, we will shift over to um, React Native so that we can have um, you know, both platforms, Android and, and iOS. Right, right. And then when you like when you first launched this thing, did, how did you promote it? I mean, did you just put it on your ATS, or uh, how, how did you how did you get the word out? Well, we went to a place called TravCon. Uh, I'd say a place. It is a uh, conference every year. It takes place in Las Vegas. It's at the end of September, and it is a variety of different vendors and about fifteen hundred travelers. They could be occupational therapists. They could be speech therapists. They could be registered nurses. Allied Health, you name it, they're attending this conference. So that was our jump off point. And we did uh, some marketing, some advertising, but it was people that walked by that we would say, mm -hmm. hey, have you seen Aaron Health? Let me show you. And I have recorded 
dozens of people using this for the very first time that said, this is amazing. This accelerates what I formerly had to take days to go do. I can now do with one app. So that was our jump off point. We've made some refinements since, and we have a new version coming out this week. So we did a very soft opening September 26th, yet our downloads have been, <laughs> there are 400% of what we expected them to be at this time. Um, and without doing any marketing at all, Fantastic. this next version that, that we've got um, offers some new features such as multi-layered mapping, RV parks, um, um, a variety of different things that they can put into their map refinements or their map filters and see them in real time. So, um, man, yeah, I love this idea. <laughs> Good. I'm glad. It just, it just seems it just seems like so obvious, but no one else is yeah. doing it. It's great. Right. Yeah, we were the first. Now everybody will be chasing us, and we'll be already on to the next thing. <laughs> so since you guys were the since you're the founder and you, you guys came up with the idea, then it was easy to to get it past any roadblocks, which would say, "Oh no, this is dumb," or do some more validation to make sure that this is real. I mean, so that that was that was easy, right? You didn't have to do any of that. Well, we did. We had three different focus groups over the okay. course of about six months. And we would put the phone in front of them, their phone, or put the app on their phone and say, use it. No instruction whatsoever. Mm -hmm. We'd wait for an hour and film it. That's the best way to, to do it. Do not give them any guidance and see if they can figure it out. <laughs> and do you want to even use it? Is this something that you would use? So close it yeah. and go. We don't care what you do. Close it and go to use Something else, Robinhood, SMS, we don't care. If this is an yep. engaging app and you're going to stay with it for the full hour, we want to film what you're doing. Then the next thing we would do is we'd say, go find a job. And they would go find a job that they want. And hey, did you find a job? First time we did the focus group? No, it didn't work. They, they, some people found a job, some people didn't. They would come back, find a job that you want. Now 80% of the people are finding a job that they want. Third time, everybody found a job that they want. And then we did a few more focus groups on the different features until we said it's ready. And that's when we launched in September. If we weren't ready in September, we wouldn't have launched in September. The soft opening, like I said, gave us feedback that now uh, once we have this next launch in November, then you will start to see us all over the place. We will be marketing the heck out of it. Fantastic. And what's the business model here? I mean, who do you charge? Uh, so we charge the... Uh, agencies that represent the nurses. So the job that we have on our app is uh, provided by somebody. Let's say it's Acme Nursing. Acme Nursing would gov give us a percentage of what they are taking in for placing that nurse at the hospital. Okay, so it's kind of like a Craigslist job posting sort of thing. They yeah. take a percentage. You you, char you don't charge the 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 seekers anything, right? They, they just get free free access to it, even Clinicians though they get so much value. Exactly. The hospital doesn't pay anything and the clinician doesn't pay anything. It's the intermediary that's representing both that pays a small, very small fee. Very cool. Very cool. So, yeah. so I know this is, it's a little early, but let's think about your future. Like where's, where's Aaron going? Like what's next for it or what's next for stop by what's next for your in the organization period? A uh, great question. We are very bullish on personal assistant, uh, Alexa, Siri, and that's what we are developing now. So we think that that will round out the holistic uh, offering, service offering for our suite. In fact, it's it's available now, um, but it's only available on some of our Alexas. Uh, pretty soon you'll be able to say, Alexa, open Aaron Health. Find a job for me in Los Angeles. And, and Aaron Health will reply back. What type of job are you looking for? What's important to you? How much money are you looking to make? So as granular as you want to be with your personal assistant looking for your job, Aaron Health will be able to do that on your device. As well, you can say, Aaron Health will say, hey, what would you like me to save this job search for the future? Next time you walk in with your groceries, Aaron Health will pop up on Alexa and say, hey, that $5,000 a week job that you were looking for by the beach just became available. Would you like me to submit you? Yes. And before you're even unloading your first head of lettuce, you're submitted for the position that you were looking for through our app on Alexa or Siri. Wow, I love that. I want to see it for all jobs. You, if you think, think about getting, uh, like going out of this, the healthcare space and doing it elsewhere, or is it really, sure. really nicheable into that space? Well, we're really focused right now. I, I think that particularly this pandemic has brought the need to bring clinicians to patients faster than what we've been able to before. And that's where we're really focused. 
it, I'm, I'm quite certain that this same model applies to other industries and other markets, but right now we're just focused on healthcare. Okay. So let's back up to a bit to sort of your startup experience. Can you tell me a bit about uh, a huge challenge that you came across and how you overcame it? Uh, yeah. So the easiest, and I've mentioned this in other podcasts I've been part of, I think adoption. And I, I don't think it, I think it transcends even software. There's a, there's a difficult adoption in just about everything. I mean, look at electric vehicles today. Um, there is a small percentage but when you talk to somebody, I, I'm, a, I'm an EV owner, I, I own a Tesla and I absolutely love Tesla. But sometimes when I talk to somebody else, they say, oh, I, tell me about Tesla. I'm just not sure yet. So that's, I would say, the biggest challenge with, with just about everybody that does any sort of innovation. The, um, I started my career developing systems for Kaiser Permanente in California. And I worked on the appointment advice call center project, as well as the teleservice team project and developing something that accelerated clinical care and getting the community within the hospital to adopt it was a struggle. It was a struggle. It was something that was new. Going from a manual way to an automated way, especially physicians that are traveling between three different facilities, hey, you no longer have to go look at the x-ray over there. You can look at the x-ray anywhere you want. Just that new paradigm shift, that adoption was not easy. It took time and it took credibility and, and take, putting time back into their day. All of a sudden, when they start coming back to you and saying, can you do this? That's when you know you've won. Yeah, it's, it's amazing how even no matter how broken the system is, you can present them with something that's totally amazing and you know will save them time and money and whatever, but they're still, they're still have a tough time picking it up. It's like, it's all, I guess it's a human thing. Like we don't like change, even if the change is for a good thing. Yeah, you nailed it. You nailed it. It's the change, you know, and I, I probably fall into this as well. I'm sure that if somebody recorded me throughout the year, there's, I'm going to have that, that perceived barrier for going to, to change something. So I don't, I don't want to suggest it's, it, it, everybody goes through this, but it was interesting showing somebody, Hey, this will put time back into your day and get you more time for clinical care. It wasn't, instant. It took time. And I would say it took over a year for that adoption to really start to take hold. Wow. Was there any particular te uh, techniques that you used to improve, uh, to accelerate the adoption? We do now. We ask early on. <laughs> <laughs> in hindsight, this is what we should have yeah. done. <laughs> Participate in the process. Hey, we're going we're gonna to do this. What do you think? And then when people are participating they now have, they're personally invested into its success because they were part of it. Now you have early adopters that are going to help with your late adopters. I've made the mistake personally of coming in and saying, look how great it is, go use it. And the first thing humans do is say, screw you, I'm not gonna go use this because you're telling me I have to. So bringing them, them in early and having them participate in, and, and by the way, I've had people bring ideas to us that we've never thought of. And they're not programmers, they're not engineers, yeah. and they're phenomenal ideas that we've now yeah. incorporated into our platforms. Yeah. So speaking of that, did you actually have any design thinking sessions where you brought customers in or pr prospective folks in before or during the process? Or, or was did. that at the end? Yeah, every platform that we've built, we had clinicians, we had stakeholders from um, the clinic clinical community, we had hospitals, we've had recruiters, we've had business development managers, anybody that's an actor within that process, we had early on. When we built our first platform, which was originally called Valley Force, and we changed the name to StaffBot, StaffBot ATS, we developed that in 2015. I like StaffBot better. Good job <laughs> so changing <much> it. Better. <laughs> <laughs> so much better. <laughs> so that was in 2015, and I will say that I was very myopic when I built that platform. It was... Um, and I had other people that joined in later, but I was, this is the way that we're doing it. And it, it was not the way to go, it, frankly, because you end up redoing things. Somebody yeah. else that has a better idea, you know, I, I had blinders on, this is the way that we should be doing it. And somebody came in and had a better idea. And all of a sudden you're changing the organizational structure, your entity relationship, because you didn't yeah. think about that hierarchy that is a better idea than the one that you invented. Yeah. So now it's just, you know, that selfishness had consequences. And now bringing in people early to contribute and participate in the design 
design criteria, acceptance criteria is is a way better idea. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh yeah, it's like early and often, right? Iterate as much as early you can and, and bring bring them in at the beginning if you can. Indeed. Fantastic, indeed. All right, so now it's time to think like a futurist. It's ten years out. It's the year twenty thirty one. Where where are you going to be? Where is your company going to be? Oh gosh. Um... I have not thought well, that far. Well, you, be, you mentioned get, earlier about how Alexa, you know, you get home and Alexa's saying to you, hey, I got a job for you. I mean, when is it going to actually apply on your behalf and then maybe do an interview on your behalf? Or how is it going to, like, what's your next step? Yeah, I, I, I this is, you're talking, speaking of adoption, and I'm a big believer in blockchain. I think blockchain is going to, ch it's going to change the landscape of just about every industry that we've got today. It is the real truth. The things that we do over and over and over again, blockchain rids us of that repetitive process. So that adoption, the introduction and adoption of blockchain 10 years from now will change everything that we've got today. Mm -hmm. We still do background checks. We still do employment verifications. We still do education verifications. We still do things that are unnecessarily repetitive. Yeah. I think that, that in 10 years, we will look back, hopefully on your, broad, your broadcast and say, they were talking about blockchain back then. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's true. I mean, if you think about how much stuff is just done over and over and over again, even though it's kind of like the whole yeah. TSA pre-check. Now I have to go through the whole thing. Like mine just right. expired and I have to go through it again. It's like, I'm not a different person. I'm the same person I was before it expired, but still you're making yes. me do this. It's like, can I just re-up or something? You, I mean, you know, it's so true, Chris. And it's funny. You go to, <laughs> when I go to the airport, I've, I'm a clear member. So going to clear, you know, they do the iris or the fingerprint verification. Fantastic. It's got your sorts of truth, whether you're for or against, but it's got your vaccinations in the, yep. in the clear app. It's that hasn't changed. So why are you asking me for this again? Clear yep. figured it out. They figured it out. And I hope that it becomes pervasive throughout a, a variety of different use cases. But yep. you brought up a very, see, very good one. I think, I think you hit it the nail on the head there because the technology works. And it works right. as long as we use it. I think it's it's us sort of holding ourselves back from actually just going ahead and doing it. It's almost like we're living in like a pre prehistoric world. The technology around us is all futuristic right. and it can do all sorts of things, but we refuse to use it. <laughs> oh, it's so true. You know, I, I said, I, I'm going to repeat this again. I said it a few years ago. So I, 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 it's not instant. I didn't just conjure this, but hospitals, banks also, they change systems when they're, they're legislated or litigated. Yeah. It's right there in front of them, and, and that's a broad brush. So I don't want to say that this is the hospitals don't innovation because they have the best innovation here in the U.S. But yeah. you know things like what I just suggested, accepting blockchain verifications, it, it it can work today for absolute certain. It's indisputable, and it would yeah. accelerate clinical care. But I just don't think that they're ready to start using it today. Yeah, yeah, and of course with banks, it's like whenever you say blockchain they think crypto and they all freak out right <laughs> totally yeah 100 percent. absolutely absolutely like, we don't want to touch that with a 10-foot pole they're like wait a minute <laughs> exactly right exactly right <laughs> all of your customers are touching it with 10-foot poles you know they're, they're into it i've you know there's tons of yeah tons of people i know who've got you know all sorts of investment in crypto and the banks are like oh we don't want to go there and like all of your customers yeah. have already gone there so <laughs> it's it's know. going whether you're in the boat or not the boat you can you can be part of it or not be part of it your choice but it's happening yeah that's and I, right. I think that that is that is it you know we call air and health a movement and a, a, i think a lot of what happens with innovation it transcends what i'm doing but it, it is it's hearing loud voices in a movement hey why aren't we providing clinical care faster well yeah. i can answer some of it because we're doing repetitive things before you can get a nurse or a doctor in front of you when, when people start answering those very the questions as loud as the questions are being answered, then some of these things will have a faster adoption. Yeah, yeah. But if you think about it, I mean, at the root of this, isn't this all about trust? It's like, are you the person that we think you are and do you do what you say you do? And then like, once you have that source of truth, like you say in the blockchain, where this is all immutable right. and this is definitely that person and we know what they've done in the past, we know, we know what their track record is, then it should just be a quick check and you're in. You're right. If it's immutable, yeah. the, you know, it's interesting. Um, I have heard that same question. I'm not sure that I trust it yet. Well, you're taking a scanned piece of paper today. <laughs> so yeah, exactly. tell me which one of those two things is, 
but more trustworthy than the other. If you're taking a leap of faith with a PDF, why not take a leap of faith with my blockchain? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. For some reason, we have this. It's, it's. I guess it's a human thing, right? A piece of a piece of solid paper, you know, no matter what it looks like, is more of a thing than you know a triple encrypted PGP whatever. <laughs> right. I, I've had people, you know, and you see it. It's it's been scanned and faxed and scanned and faxed. I I think I don't even know who uses faxes today, but nonetheless, no no, two years ago. I would still see faxes, scans and faxes. Is yeah. that a nine or is that an eight? And you know, the, yeah. you're telling the person on the other end, that's a nine. Oh, okay, that's fine. So that you would accept. <laughs> highly secure, highly secure. I love Indeed. it. So where yeah, do you see right. where do you see Aaron specifically being in 10 years? I mean, in 2031, you've got to you must have be, be like way beyond where you are at where you're at now. Yeah, I, I think that predictive analytics and so that once you know. I think it's going to be Aaron offering things to people. Hey, I think you're going to be interested in this because of your behavior in the past. Uh, this is where you work today, or you were interested in a job the other day. You like hiking. This fits all those things. Hey, this is something that I think you'd be interested in. And and giving people a, a an enhanced life experience because we were able to predict something based on their behavior. I know that sounds creepy to a lot of people, but I genuinely, I, I appreciate that. So I don't have to scroll through and pour through research. Things are presented to me that frankly, I'm going to engage with. I think Aaron Health is going to do the same. Yeah, no, uh, that's the thing that always drives me crazy is that all of these devices around us, they know so much about us. They know so much about what we like, what we, what we do, when we do it, mm -hmm. all of that, but they don't proactively do anything. They still have to, we still have to ask them to do stuff. It's like, right. why can't you just do stuff on my behalf? Not yet. If I don't like yeah. it, I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. I think with, we talked about adoption. We have generational adoption. I think as oh, yeah. you know, the younger crowds, they come in, I, I, you know, I'm 51 years old. I still think pretty immaturely. I appreciate that, that it can set, tell me what it thinks I'm going to like, because generally I do. That's great. Yeah. yeah. Well, like, the, like I remember about, I, I think I wrote this about like five or six years ago, like I'm driving to pick up my son from school and I'm going to be late. It's like mm -hmm. my system should automatically text him and say, hey, your dad's going to be five minutes late. You know, what, right. why do I, like, what do I have to pull over? And it's like, yeah, exactly. It's, 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 it's like, and it's just this simple stuff like that, which would, you know, I'd really appreciate. I mean, users would really appreciate even that is stuff that, you know, for, I don't know why they just don't go ahead and do some of these things. I mean, it makes, makes sense to me, but. Yeah. What a great use case. I think yeah. that too. And I, I believe that one of the, I'm going to butcher this. I put in a destination not long ago and it recognized the destination. One of my contacts and said, would you like me to share your trip with this person? And I thought, yeah. I think it was the new iOS. I thought, wow, I didn't even ask, but heck yeah. I don't have to tell yeah. you I'm going to be five minutes late to pick up my son now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> my son's going to know. <laughs> I mean, but I had seen that before. That... I thought, what a great, it's yeah. great innovation. No, I, I mean, if they would just be more proactive, that'd be great. I have a feeling there's going to be this like tidal wave of proactivity at some point where they're just going to say, okay, let's just do it and see what happens. But I mean, right. I would like that. I don't know about younger folks. I remember talking to a millennial once at some event and I, I talked to him about this whole proactive world and i wish these things would do things for us and he was like oh no i don't want that i i want agency over everything and i'm like are you, aren't you tired of doing stuff by yourself <laughs> yeah yeah exactly i i think that there is a shelf life to that philosophy um and i know that sounds like i said i, I it's going to sound creepy to a lot of people i just find it very convenient i would yep. love to go to the store and only see the things that i would ultimately buy anyway instead of going in aisle after aisle after aisle and thinking about it ultimately to leave with the exact same inventory that I otherwise would have purchased without that. Yeah, so exactly. I appreciate it. It's one less we thing I have to stress to about. to optimize our lives. <laughs> yes, I can go mountain biking quicker. I can go snowboarding faster. I can enjoy the things that are, that's why I live on this planet. And those are yeah. the things I want to do. I don't want to shop yeah. for the, the semi-ripe banana. <laughs> exactly, exactly. It's like, um, let's use technology to help us spend more time doing the things we love and take away the, the annoying stuff that we don't need, we don't like anymore. So exactly, love to see exactly. that. Exactly. And I think that's how a lot innovators think. Uh, I, 
like I said, we have we have a generational wave of adoption coming through. So I I enjoy it. I hope it, yeah, I hope it changes in that way. This is great. So uh, if somebody wants to get in touch with you, what's the best way? Just hit your website or? Yeah, I can be reached at steve at staffbot.com. Um, go to my website. You'll see Drift come up. They can message me directly. It'll be one of our, our team that is going to respond, but they can easily ask for me. Uh, download uh, in the app store, Aaron Health, or go to aaronhealth.com. Um, to learn about the app and how many jobs that we've got today. Fantastic. Love it. Well, this is, this is great. Thanks for, thanks for coming on the show. This has been great. And I'll Chris, put all your so much for having me. information in the show notes and uh, all of that good stuff. So thanks. Great. Thank you, sir. Thanks so much, Chris. Take care. Bye-bye.